In the last episode, things went a bit wrong for the Voyager crew. Forced to abandon ship after hitting a space mine and getting all irradiated, they were kidnapped and brainwiped by people from a planet that needed workers. On the plus side, this means they've all found gainful employment. You could even argue they're happier now, as long as you're willing to ignore that happiness being implanted. It's all good, though, as a few of the crew were off in the Delta Flyer Jr. doing one of them their away mission things, and they returned to find the dock in command, complete with jacket, though not, I note, the captain's pips from before. Maybe Janeway vetoed that bit. Captain Doctor, along with Chakotay, Neelix, and the other one, popped over to the planet that kidnapped the rest of the crew to find out what happened, and were bluntly told to piss off as a result. Never once to ignore the chance for a diplomatic incident, Chicote and Neelix snuck onto the planet, posing as workers to find out more. The finding out more turned into reverse kidnapping Balana and Chicote getting trapped on some industrial walkways while being chased by guards. We rejoin him now, prevented from escaping over the side of the walkway by a force field as two lads with guns close in. Things are desperate, so as per Starfleet regulations, we turn to smashing shit. In this case, it's a gizmo controlling the force field, and one of the guards comes to check out the noise. He thinks Chicote might have jumped, an assumption proven wrong when Chicote twats him. Fighting ensues, and the fighting turns into pooping when Chicote gets one of the guns. He's injured in the process, which suggests the weapons aren't for stunning, and he just straight up killed a couple of guys. While he's scarpering, so is Voyager. We'll assume Balan has either been fixed or knocked out, as the dock is on the bridge. He and Kim stop the two pursuing ships, mostly the dock if we're keeping score, but are forced to reconsider returning to the planet for Chicote by five more incoming ships. Time to scarper some more and rethink things. Chicote's injured and bleeding everywhere, so naturally the best place to hide is a busy pub. Two popo-looking guys arrive, the one on the right possibly being the lad who tried to nick Voyager in the last episode. They ask around, Paris learning about Balana's disappearance in the process, and he points them to Chicote or would have done had Chicote not taken the opportunity to scarper. Voyager's parked on a moon while we repair the kaboomed stuff, and that gives us a chance to sort out Balana, too. The doc gave her some sleepy time juice to assess her condition, as the brainial alterations are quite complicated. It'll take a while to fix, and he thinks Neelix reminding her about things from the past might help matters. Speaking of treatment, Tuvok's in for some as well. The dodgy doc who drugged both he and Janeway in the flashbacks is talking to another doctor, one who seems to not know the truth about what's going on as they discuss Tuvok's condition as though it were natural rather than induced by the brain fuckery. The other doctor seems to think this condition is rare, suggesting either there aren't many kidnapped workers or that the failure rate is particularly low. We jump again to find Seven asking the power plant supervisor about Tuvok, specifically if his condition could be contagious as she's been seeing more resurfacing memories. And she's not the only person who has questions. The detective from the pub is here to ask about Chicote, which I think officially makes him more interested in the character than anybody on the writing team for the last seven years. The person who manages to find him is Janeway. He's trying to hide, and after being told in the pub earlier that Janeway was moving in with Marvin Trillian, he thought her apartment would make a good bolt hole. I'd have waited till she was finished shifting her stuff myself, but the quantity of claret that he's leaking might have forced the issue. Tangentially, if this is what happened from a hit to the shoulder, I think we can probably assume those two guards he blasted in the chest won't get a mention in his official report. Anywho, Chicote chooses to be honest with Janeway and admit that he was involved with the disappearance of Balana, but explains why and also lowers the gun. If Janeway has questions about why he's both injured and carrying a gun from a guard, she keeps them to herself and instead offers to help treat him. Speaking of treatment, Balana's being shown around her own quarters. She takes the news that she's married to the bartender well, though to be fair, Paris is a lot easier to like if you delete multiple years of knowing him. Items around the room trigger memories, even the ones that are using the wrong props, like the Batleth. Maybe they put the special one away for safekeeping. Tuvok's idea to spark memories in Seven is proving equally successful. She snuck into the supervisor's room so she can look at Tuvok's employee record and all the ones that he's accessed. As to why he had access to other people's data, well, maybe their security is as good as Starfleet. It certainly didn't stop Seven. Let's catch up with Chakotay and Janeway. She's treating his injury while they chat, him telling her about Voyager and probing how she feels about her life here. Kim calls to check on things and update Chakotay on their status. Voyager's a few light years away now after legging it from those ships, and it'll take a few days to repair, but Balana's doing well, so that's nice, I guess. 
Chicote tells Kim to keep Stumm until he's signalled, while also dropping that he's with the captain. Not the most subtle way of delivering that particular piece of data, and the result is a very hesitant Janeway. Even deleting the alien makeup to prove that he's the same species as her doesn't entirely convince her, and talking it over with Marvin Trillian doesn't help much either. He thinks the whole thing is dodgy as fuck, and you've got to admit that he has a point, what with the kidnapping and those two corpses he probably made. Chicote's only got himself to blame on that one. It's not really a surprise, then, when the door of Janeway's apartment opens to reveal not her, but instead the detective looking for Chicote. Was it Janeway, Marvin, or both of them? That's not important to Chicote, who goes for his gun and doesn't quite make it. We've decided these guns have a stun setting after all. Either that or their medical technology is very impressive, and it fixed the front of his jacket too. Regardless, Chicote's awake and refusing to answer questions about Balana or Neelix. The discovery of his implanted comm badge seems to make him reconsider, but it's academic as some other guards show up and say they're taking over custody. The detective thinks this is a bit dodgy, but doesn't put up any real fight as he's wheeled away. There's no reason to worry, though, as Chakotay's perfectly fine. He must be as he's calling Kim and telling him to come to the planet. Don't worry, son, it's definitely not a trap. The now-removed comm badge is taken away, and Dodgy Doc tells the guy who I'm now pretty sure tried to steal Voyager to go and take care of it properly this time. The supervisor from the power plant is there too, so he's in on it as well if you're keeping track. We're not the only ones trying to piece it together, as the detective is talking to Seven at the bar Paris works in. She's found that over a hundred new workers, most from the same species, all started at the power plant on the same day, and all went through a particular department of the hospital. It's also the one Chicote was being taken to when he was wheeled away. You know, the one to do with brainial stuff. That's all well and good, says the detective, but he's been relieved of duty. His boss apparently thinks that giving him a load of free time and nothing to lose is the best way to stop him from sniffing about, a decision that I suspect might have one or two flaws. Paris joins them as Seven is telling the detective to interview Tuvok, but he's worried that he'll be reported if he tries to pull that shit at the hospital. Seven's already shown herself to be a dab hand at the old espionage, though, so she'll have a go. She's talking to the doctor that isn't in on things, explaining her symptoms, and he's a little surprised at yet another of the very rare condition he saw in Tuvok and Chicote. He's not the authority on it, though, and Seven demands to see the expert, which coincidentally gives her time alone with a computer that he's not bothered to lock. I guess we'll add GDPR violations to the list of problems at this hospital. Other inquiries are ongoing too. The detective may not be willing to risk himself at the hospital, but he will strong-arm his way into Marvin Trillian's home so he can interrogate Janeway. At least he's taking the subject seriously, I suppose. As is the second Doctor, the one who's not in on it. Not yet, anyway. He's looked at the same files that Seven accessed on his PC and put all of the pieces together like a great big criminal jigsaw. He makes some threats to Dodgy Doc, which is an interesting plan when you're dealing with people who are willing to kidnap and white brains before deflating when shown he's got nowhere to turn. Nowhere, that is, unless he's willing to join and become part of the conspiracy. It might be the wrong time to join if activity at the bar is any indication. Despite some security dickheads looking for Seven, Paris is willing to hide her in a back room of the bar along with Janeway, Marvin and the detective. Sounds like a resistance group to me, and that's precisely what it is, plans being made to try and both uncover and then fight what's going on. Janeway remembers Chicote's call to Voyager and Kim explaining how they were able to get in touch. She thinks she can use a communications gizmo at the power plant to call them, and Marvin will go with her. Seven suggests that she and the detective should go back to the hospital under the pretense of him having captured her. That'll give them the chance to look for Tuvok and Chicote. As to Paris, well, Paris is going to... He's... he's going to... he's... he's going to stay here and sit on his ass. Seven's on a bed in the hospital while the detective explains to the dodgy doc that he had to sedate her. The detective tries to push for seeing other patients, presumably Tuvok and Chakotay, and the dodgy doc declines. Well, subtlety isn't working, so the detective just pulls a gun on the prick instead, while Seven grabs hold of him as he attempts to scarper. At least Janeway and Marvin have been a bit more successful on the stealth front. We've been able to break through the door to the power plant control room with some lightning, apparently, because why bother with decent security on something that affects the entire population? Regardless, they're in, and calling Voyager, with both Kim and Balana responding, so her treatment must be coming along nicely. 
Less nice is relaying the news that Jakote is in hospital, but we might be able to solve all of this if we can just bugger up the shield that prevents teleportation. Shutting down the whole power grid will do it, as long as you don't give any thought to the number of injuries and deaths caused by accidents as a result, all the patients who'll die in hospitals if they don't have backup systems. That's not our problem, though, so, you know, fuck em. What is our problem is the group of ships that just started pooping at Voyager. Kim and company leg it, while Janeway is accosted by a couple of guards. Marvin to the rescue with a possibly non-lethal electrocution before just pooping both another guard and the unarmed supervisor. I wonder if these guns are stunning today. Shutting everything down properly is a bit of a faff, especially with more guards around, so Janeway's just going to cause an overload instead. The computer will detect it and automatically shut down the system. Well, probably. Depends if it was made by the same company who designed the doors, I guess. As they're cocking about with reactors, and Seven's little posse is freeing Chicote, rip the other dock by the way, Voyager's getting the shit kaboomed out of it. Kim has an idea and spits out escape pods while covering their life signs. We're called by the same guy who tried to steal Voyager before, and who we've seen dotted about the place, who tells the dock to surrender as he's been abandoned again. Joke's on him, as those escape pods, of which each ship has handily grabbed one, do a kaboom and fuck them all up. Maybe we put fireworks on them, or maybe they're just prone to exploding. Could go either way with Starfleet. We fly back to the planet while Janeway finishes screwing up the power plant. The shield falls and our crew are teleported back to Voyager, meaning none of them have to hear the cries of fear and pain as the whole city loses power and countless innocent lives are lost. The conspiracy's been blown wide open, and Voyager's hosting the detective to say thanks, as well as the ambassador we spoke to in part one, who definitely didn't know anything about it, honest. We aren't told how many other high-ranking officials had absolutely no idea, but I suspect this week we'll see an uptick in the sale of paper shredders. The crew were adapting to their life back on Voyager, which means Paris has reverted to a TV addict. At least that means he's not flirting with customers in a bar. And Marvin Trillian has learned that he's not one of the 1,000 or so people who were kidnapped, and really is who he says he is. That means he's free to come along with us if he wants, but joining will also mean that he's part of the crew, so he and Janeway won't be allowed to bang. He declines anyway, as he's been promoted at the power plant. I guess engaging in firefights among delicate machinery is just the sort of can-do attitude that his managers are looking for. Janeway bids him farewell before returning to the bridge to take command, and we leave the viewer to wonder just how many innocent bystanders we killed on this adventure as we fly away. At the end of the last episode we were left with a number of questions, so why don't we go over them and see how we fared with regards to answers. How did they manage to build an industrial complex with insufficient labour to support itself initially? The cause behind the labour shortage is never raised, and nothing rational really seems to fit the bill. A public health event sufficient to kill off not only a large portion of this planet's population, but also on other planets in the sector, is the sort of thing you'd expect somebody to mention. Same with a war, same with mass migration. In fact, any event that resulted in a large, swift change in population would be in the public consciousness, especially with newcomers to talk to. A slow drain of people over time moving elsewhere doesn't really fit either. A lack of workers means that you must, by necessity, scale your industry to fit your capacity. Being able to immediately find work in critical infrastructure for over a hundred people doesn't gel with that logic, nor does it make sense in the wider context. If this drain has been happening city-wide, where would that extra power be used? Powering more machinery doesn't work without the staff to run them, and before you jump into the comments to say that they're staffed with the rest of the kidnapped 1,000 people, why would you do the power plant last? Was everybody that came before just standing about until we found a crew with the right skills to run the power plant? I'm a firm believer in not answering every question, as a bit of work on the viewer's part can help integrate them with the fiction, but this one is so core to the plot that it feels jarring in its absence. <laughs> Who benefits from the increase in capacity? We get a hint at this one from Dodgy Doc. He says he's making money on the side from all this kidnapping malarkey, so it's clear somebody is benefiting. We don't learn who, but we don't really need to. That nudge towards greed being the driving factor suggests a profit motive, either from excessive consumption by an elite or the export economy we suggested. Either way, it explains why the increase in productivity makes sense when the general population already seemed to have a pretty good quality of life without shortages, and that was the main reason it bothered me. How much of the workforce makes and administers the brain juice? 
Looks like I was just plain wrong on this one. I'd assumed the injections at the plant were dodgy and part of the conspiracy, but the lack of mention again suggests that they existed purely to provide Tuvok with a reason to lose his shit. A shout out to the comments for realising this before I did, as well as those who pointed out that three weeks on the planet would probably have done real bad shit to Seven and Ramrod as they wouldn't be recharging their Borg bits. We'll assume Naomi was with Ensign Mum, as that makes the most sense from a brain reprogramming point of view. Two out of three's not bad, I guess, but the one we didn't answer was the most important. Oh well. That big red reset button gets slammed again, everything going back to how it was. Not unexpected, as that's the modus operandi for the show, but a little disappointing when you consider that this is the last season and they could have just gone silly with it if they'd wanted. Hell, just saying a couple of the former Marquis crew preferred it here and wanted to stay would have been something. Nobody would have noticed, it's not like anybody's keeping track of the crew numbers. Overall, not a terrible story, and the change of scenery certainly helps inject a little fresh air into things, but the slower pace of the second part left me feeling that there are other stories that would have benefited from the two-parter treatment more than this one. Imagine how much more political manoeuvring and ethical dubiousness we could have had in The Void, for example, if we'd stretched that one out. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'd be picking that apart in the same way as I'm doing here. All I know is that the story was okay. Middle of the road. Fine. That's an acceptable state of affairs for your one-and-done episodes, but when you're investing the time to make it something more, I don't think slightly increased expectations are entirely unreasonable. End of episode. Why is it called Deep Space Nine when it's in orbit around a planet? I don't know. Maybe it's measured from Earth. Well, that don't work, does it? Then every space station would be called Deep Space. Why do you care? We're gonna be there for over a year. I think understanding the name matters. Well, it was called Terraknor before the Cardigans left, so you could call it that. Oh yeah, that'll go down great with the neighbours, won't it? Using the same name as the people who enslaved them. That's a thought. Why aren't the Bajorans giving it a name? Perhaps the trauma is too recent for them to consider reclaiming the focus of their oppression. Who knows though? Maybe one day they'll call it liberation, or victory. Or something like that. Well, I was thinking more along the lines of Prophet's cock ring, but yours worked too, I guess. Woof.